Sorry, my brain is so fried. Um, I hope the exam I sent out last night was clear. Uh, if it's not, if you have any questions, email me. Uh, it's due a week from today in class. Typed all nine yards. Um, again, if you have any questions, ask. I apologize for uh, our not being able to discuss Henry V in person. I think I've decided I'm just going to bag Henry V. Uh, you know, the the lecture I sent you was kind of a, it was a, a one night a week class, but it it wasn't what I would normally do with something like that, which is why there was a lot of um, the Hollow Crown version, in, no, not the Hollow Crown version, the Kenneth Brownell version included, I think. Um, on that because literally I think every class that I've tried to teach Henry V, something has happened. It's, it's like my personal Macbeth. I mean, it just, I'm cursed with it. So as much as I love to play, uh, I'm probably going to stop even trying. Um, okay, so Midsummer Night's Dream. A couple of things. I, I just want to, you know, raise a couple of questions about uh, a couple of comments in the introduction. And then we'll start looking at the play. And I really have no, no ground to stand on here compared to David Bevington, because David Bevington is one of the most famous Shakespeare scholars in the world, and I'm nobody. Um, but just the, even the opening paragraph, not the opening sentence, go down to, is that just one sentence? Yeah, it's the second sentence, which is seven lines down, six lines down. <clears throat> As the lovers in this play free, flee from the Athenian law to lose themselves in the forest, they reveal and discover in themselves the simultaneously hilarious and horrifying effects of sexual desire. I don't know that he was reading the same play I've read lots of times, or seen lots of times. I, I don't see the hilarious and horrifying effects of sexual desire. Um they're in the woods at all. You see a little bit of it with the king and queen of the fairies with Oberon and Titania. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, about that statement. And then go over to, and it's another one dealing with sexual desire, on page 150, left-hand column, the long paragraph at the end, it's about, I don't know, eight or ten sentences up from the bottom. The threshold of sexual awakening, it would seem, confronts them with a hazardous rite of passage, one that is especially threatening to the non-sexual friendship of their adolescent years. That's an awful lot of reading into the text. I think something that's probably not there. I mean, we could talk about it when we when we look at their at the scenes of them outside the wood in Athens compared to inside the wood. Um, and, and what those two things mean. Okay, so let's start talking about the play itself. Let's look, page 152, the dramatis personae, and in these two settings, because notice the play has two very distinct settings, and Shakespeare does this with a lot of his plays, especially the comedies, where you have one place like Athens and another place like the wood. The next play we're going to do, As You Like It, we're going to see in As You Like It, the court, and then we're going to see the Forest of Arden. Okay, so it's the same kind of thing. It's not Athens, but this in this. So, depending upon how much of the play you've read, or if you've read it before or seen it before, how many of you have read this before? Okay, a couple of you, a few of you. How many of you have seen it? Um, describe this setting. Don't just say Athens, because we already know that. So describe Athens. What does Athens represent? What does Athens suggest? Or what is Athens symbolic of? Just civilized society. Civilization. Order. What else? Why do Hermia and Lysander leave Athens? Lysander tells her. 
to flee from Athenian law. Okay? So, civilization, order, law. What about the wood? What does it suggest? What characterizes it? What may it be symbolic of? Chaos. Ah, civilization, ah, order, ah, law, or anti civilization, anti order, anti law. So, what's the opposite of civilization? Anarchy? Opposite of order, chaos. Opposite of law, disorder or disrule. Okay. So, why the two settings? Why not have everything occur here? Why does Shakespeare do this? And again, not just this play, as you like it, and there are others where he does the same kind of thing. I'm not sure if this term is applicable to settings, but it serves kind of like a foil, like a character. It, setting in the play is a character. <coughs> it's not a character like a person, but it's just as important as a person is in the play. Okay? It allows people to do what? To do things they wouldn't normally do. Because here, we're all familiar with this. This is our everyday world. We're not usually familiar with this. I don't know, unless you're, you know, we have budding anarchists among us who just, you know, throw all the shackles off of, you know, everything. In which case, you wouldn't last very long in this kind of setting. But our lives are kind of ruled by rules, order, laws, etc., etc. Notice... This is where humans have sway, and even that follows order, right? Because who's at the top? Duke Theseus, Queen Hippolyta once they get married, and then you go on down to, at the bottom, the rustic mechanicals, bottom, etc. Here, who's at the top? Fairies. Over on Titania. They're at the top of the order of fairies. Down at the bottom, you got, you know, Peas Blossom and Cobweb and, you know, various others, okay? Moat, Mustard Seed, and such. So, the play opens. <coughs> Theseus, Hippolyta, Philostrate, or Philostrate, however you want to pronounce it. I've heard it pronounced it various ways. And others come in. And Theseus is speaking. Why? He's the top of society. He's the, the head honcho. And what does he tell us? via telling Hippolyta. What's going to happen in four days' time? They're getting married. Okay? So, now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Apace kind of implies, quickly, it's, things are moving now. We've only got four days to wait. Four happy days bring in another moon. So, reckoning of time... Kind of by moon. They're getting married when? At the new moon. But oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. Why moon? What does the moon, what is the moon symbolic of? What's the Latin for moon? Luna. And so if someone is governed by the moon, ruled by the moon, we describe them as a lunatic, okay? Without reason, without order, without all that kind of stuff. So, he's kind of implying, you know, something about our marriage here. She lingers my desires like to a step dame or a dowager long withering out a young man's uh, revenue. Hippolyta, four days will quickly steep themselves in night. What do you do when you steep something? What do you steep? We only use that verb for one thing, really. Tea. Tea that's it. You don't steep your laundry, because that'd be weird, okay? You soak your laundry, you know, maybe. So, she says these four days will be what? They'll be steeped. They will be overcome by night. Four nights will quickly, and we get the first use of the word in the play, dream away the time. That is, during nighttime, it's like time just disappears. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, 
new bent in heaven shall behold the night of our solemnities. So Theseus tells Philostrate, Philostrate, go, stir up the Athenian youth, get them busy, so that they put on some kind of formal shows for our wedding. Okay? Aegeus comes in. Now Aegeus is an older character, not necessarily older than Theseus, but he's an older character, he's got a daughter, and he comes in with his daughter Hermia, Lysander, and Demetrius. Okay? Now, before we even look at this, you know, based upon your reading of it, what should Hermia look like? We're given a few descriptions. It's in the catfight scene. Small, diminutive. What else? Dark. She's dark. Okay. What about um, Helena? Tall. Tall, willowy, blonde. Okay. Lysander and Demetrius? Doesn't matter. <clears throat> Could be Chris and him, Liam Hemsworth. I mean, they're both the same, essentially. Okay. But Hermia and Helena have got to be um, very different physically. So, Aegeus, you know, wishes uh, Theseus, you know, happy greetings. And he says, what's the news? Theseus does. And we get one of Shakespeare's favorite themes. Full of vexation come I with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth Demetrius. Demetrius is kind of, you know, sulking in the background. He says, come on, come on. And Demetrius comes and stands forth. He says, this man hath my consent to marry her. That is my daughter. There's the theme. Fathers and daughters. Shakespeare loves that. Stand forth, Lysander. So Lysander comes. And this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Bewitched. He's saying what about him? He's not saying that he's literally a witch. He's done what, though? He's gotten her attention. A little more than that. He's a player? Okay, a little more than that. Yeah, he kind of tricked her. Bewitched means he's kind of, he's enchanted her somehow. Not through above board means, you know. He has given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. See, he's kind of saying like, like Sanders a poet, man. It's not fair. Demetrius can't play against this guy because he can write poetry. And he's given love tokens to her. You know, cards, candy, flowers, nice restaurants. He's courted her properly, I would say. So, thou hast by moonlight at her window sung with feigning voice, verses of feigning love, feigning with a false voice, and he uses feigning again, false love. What's he saying about Lysander? He doesn't, really love he doesn't really love her. He wants what? He wants sex. That's all he wants. We're going to see the same idea. A couple of others, especially him. And stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets. See, these are the love tokens. Bracelets of thy hair. That is, he's cut locks of his hair and had it braided into a bracelet and given it to her with rings, with gauds, with conceits, with necks, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of strong prevailment and unhardened youth. She is the unhardened youth. She is, her father says, gullible and naive. And Lysander is later put it, he's a player. He's been around. With cunning hast thou filched, stolen, my daughter's heart. Turned her obedience, which is due to me, strong patriarchal you know, society, to stubborn harshness. Now she disobeys me. So, my gracious duke, be it so, she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. So, if she doesn't right here, right now, in front of you, agree to marry Demetrius, I call on the law of Athens. Notice we're told the ancient law. The implication is you can't change this, Duke. This is long before your time. 
What's the ancient privilege? If she is mine, I may dispose of her. I can do with her what I will, which shall be either she marries Demetrius or she dies. That's a little severe, I think most of us would say. Got two daughters, I don't think I'd go that far, you know, even if I were a genius and living in ancient Athens. And Theseus, what say you, Hermia? And if I were directing this, I would have Theseus say the words to Hermia, but look at Aegeus with kind of a strange look on his face like, Hermia, what say you? Like, whoa, chill, man. Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god. Notice he's not discounting Aegeus' authority. One that composed your beauties and one blah, 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 and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Why? Because if a god is a maker of people, then that god can unmake those people as he or she feels fit. Because he is as a god to you, he can do the same with you. He's essentially just said, I got to do what the law says. Order, <laughs> civilization, Hermia. Uh, he finishes, Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. Theseus doesn't say, nope, not true. Just look at Demetrius. He's handsomer, he's taller, he's better built, he's got a bigger bank account. No, he just says, in himself he is. You're right, he is. But he what? One thing that is lacking your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. The only reason Demetrius is better than Lysander, her father says so. That's it. I would my father look but with my eyes. What does she mean? I wish he'd say it more concisely. Exactly. He's seeing it through his eyes. I wish he looked through my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. You have to teach your eyes to agree with his judgment. So she says, okay, let me know what's the worst that can happen if I don't go along with this. The worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. To die the death that the law requires, but he, adds, he throws in another option. <coughs> Notice, what did Aegeus request? Marriage or death? Two options. She says, what if I don't marry him? Kind of taking that one option out. Okay. Death, that's one of the original two, or to abjure forever the society of men. That is, we're going to send you off to a convent. To the virgin goddess, Diana. Therefore, fair Hermia. And he does get at the question of sexual desire in this little speech. Question your desires. Know of your youth. Examine well your blood. Whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun for I to be in shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the fr cold, fruitless moon. Why are the hymns faint? Because they're not a full-throated, passionate, you know, song to virginity. Yay, Diana, princess of virgins. We're having fun here. That's kind of right notice he's you know he's not gonna knock the gods he's not going to knock diana thrice blessed they that master sow their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage they are blessed thrice who can do this kind of like shakespeare via theseus wants to make sure his theological ducks are in a row and that he doesn't counter what saint paul says about virginity and such but earthly or happy, earthlier, down here in the rough and tumble of earth, where men and women get together, 
Is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness? How is the rose distilled? Its essence is taken away from it. He's talking about the loss of virginity through sex. So she says, so will I grow, so live, so die, my Lord. That is, like that virgin rose, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship. I'm not going to give my virginity to him, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Here's another big theme in Shakespeare, sovereignty. In fact, it's in English literature. It's the theme ultimately behind Sir Gowan, not Sir Gowan of the Green Knight. Chaucer is the wife of Bastille. Theseus, no, no, you don't have this right now. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> don't do anything rash. Take time. And by the next new moon, which is when? Four days. And what happens on that next new moon? He and Hippolyta are getting married. Now, who's Hippolyta? Other than his fiance, Queen of the Amazons. What do you know about the Amazons? Somebody in here saw Wonder Woman. A little bit. They're all women. They're all women? They're fierce warriors. How fierce? Um, um, feared, fierce. Feared, fierce. These women were such crazy, fierce warriors, according to Greek mythology, because they were all right-handed, they would chop off their left breast so that when they pulled the bow back, that breast would not get in the way of letting the string go. I mean, that's some serious dedication, okay? How is Theseus marrying her? Because they were pretty anti-men. He defeated her in battle. Okay? We're going to hear about that in a bit. Okay? Or did we... No, they didn't talk about it yet. So, he says... Next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship. Upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will or else wed Demetrius or go to Diana's altar. And Demetrius speaks. Come on, Hermia. And he says to Lysander, yield thy crazy title to my certain right. My title, that is, she's given herself to you. Yield that back to me. Lysander, you have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. And Shakespeare introduces a little, a little questionable sexual desire there. Her father loves you. You two go off. Let me have Hermia. Do you marry him? Now, imagine Shakespeare's audience for a moment. So we've got the globe. Not quite. You've got the stage over here, and then you've got the galleries. Okay. There are three levels here. This is the yard <coughs> or pit. Okay. And the groundlings are standing in here. Who are the groundlings? The poor, for the most part. The people who can afford a penny. Okay. To sit in the various seats, because bear in mind there's three levels of seats here. Okay. Prices go up. Okay. And depending on where you sit, the prices might be a little bit different. In other words, there's seats over here that aren't quite as good as seats here and seats here, even with your top level or bottom level. The queen had a box right about here, actually. Okay? So, the least wealthy people would tend to buy groundling tickets. And they would come and stand in here. The ground, the, the pit was essentially dirt and things like um, nut holes. Holes, H-U-L-S, like walnut um, shells and such, things like that. Okay. And the people, from what we're told, from some anecdotal evidence, would bring stuff with them to eat and such. Okay. And they would also, if the intermission did not come soon enough, would relieve themselves just right where they were. They wouldn't go out to a modern day restroom. They just right there. So the players had to make sure 
that day, or the authors, had to make sure that the plays were good enough to appeal to these people who probably had described their, not mental capacity, their level of education. None, for the most part. But those who are up here are probably in the upper crust of society, or at the very least, middle class and above. Okay? The gentry and higher. Nobles, royals would be up here. Um, landowners, property owners would be sitting up here. <coughs> this would be um, you know, street sweepers, uh, tapsters, you know, people who pull the uh, um, tabs in the bars and things like that. Okay? So Shakespeare's got to appeal to both levels. So when he throws in that line, you have her father's love, Demetrius, let me have Hermia's. Probably the groundlings are bending over and slapping their knees, laughing at that, while the better educated, the refined upper crust are not properly, okay? Though I'm sure some of them, you know, probably thought it was pretty funny too. Scornful Lysander, Aegeus says, true he hath my love. What is mine, my love shall render him. She is mine. Therefore, I give it unto him. So Lysander says, I am my lord as well derived as he. The my lord, is he replying to Aegeus or is he replying to Theseus? That's an, an a uh, reader it's open to the reader. If you're directing it, it's open to the director because the director can have them turn away from Aegeus and go straight to Theseus and speak to Theseus directly these lines. Because who's the ultimate authority here? It's Theseus. Okay. I am my lord as well derived as he. Derived. I've got as good an ancestry as Lysander, as Demetrius does. My family name goes back as well as his does. Okay, so that's one thing. As well possessed. I've got as big a bank account. Here's my thing in my favor. My love is greater than his. My fortunes everywhere is fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius's. And so he's kind of saying... Thus far on the pros cons list, I'm a little bit better off. Why? She loves me. That ought to count for something. And here is more. And which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. So he kind of counts that twice. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, and he pulls the ace out of his sleeve. Demetrius? I'll vouch it to his head. That's kind of like, that's a duel, man. If he says I'm lying, I'll pay him for this. He did what? He made love to Nadar's daughter, Helena, and won her soul. Now, we take that phrase, made love, we think it means has sex. Nope, it means he wooed her. He courted her. He did the exact same things that Gia said, Lysander did, to Hermia. Wrote poetry, sang songs, gave love tokens, and did what? Won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes devoutly dotes. Dotes in idolatry. Notice he uses dotes three times. Why? He's emphasizing she is head over heels. She's lost in love for Demetrius upon this spotted and inconstant man. Spotted means tainted, sinned, inconstant, un. Faithful. Theseus. Yeah, I heard about that. Notice he doesn't say uh, irrelevant, hearsay. I heard about that. And with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof. Now that kind of implies, when did Theseus think to speak about this? Only if Aegeus brought up that he wanted Demetrius to marry his daughter? No. He's implying whether or not Aegeus had come forth, I can't have this kind of stuff going on. Why? 
What did Demetrius do to Helena? He wooed her, and now he's doing what? He's ditching her, right? Well, that does what to society? It enters a rupture. It fragments society. He's the Duke of Athens. He doesn't want his society fragmented. He wants everybody happy. Some per somebody's not happy, what happens? That not happiness starts to spread. He wants to nip that in the bud. So, he said, but, you know, I'm over full of self-affairs. Kind of like I was last week with my mother-in-law. Him, it's what? Well, I've got my wedding to plan, Gilder to invade, you know, if you're familiar with Princess Bride. But, Demetrius, come and Aegeus, you too. I have some private schooling for both of you. We don't know what that private schooling is. Other than, he says, I was going to talk to Demetrius about that, so presumably... Now he has that opportunity. So what's the private schooling for Aegeus? Well, what does he do when Hermia asks for, what's the worst that can happen? He introduces that third option. I think, totally reading into this, totally reading into it. This is his way of going, Aegeus, come on, man, don't be such a hard ass. You know, you got to give her, you got to give her a break. I mean, I'm not going to kill her unless she chooses that. If she chooses that, fine, it's on her head, be it. Okay? So, he says, For you, fair Hermia, line 117, look, you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will. Your fancies. That means both fantasies and desires. Or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate. I'm just the duke. I can't bend the laws, he suggested. Come, my Hippolyta. What cheer, my love? Why the what cheer, my love? Notice it's a question mark. It's not a statement. Nearly every production I've seen of this, especially Nashville Shakespeare Company two years ago, a festival two years ago when they when they did this they had Hippolyta listening to this speech or to these speeches by her future husband and the more he speaks the more her face gets downcast that is the angrier she gets listening to him talk about the law and father's rights and she's because remember she's an Amazon and so when he says come my Hippolyta She's already started to leave the stage. What cheer, my love? In other words, what's wrong? Kind of like he's said something, right? So they all leave, except for Lysander and Hermia. And they talk back and forth. And he gives us one of Shakespeare's great quotes. The course of true love never did run smooth. Why? Especially in Shakespeare. Who always interrupts the courts? If it's not fathers, it's brothers. That is, if it's not fathers looking out for interrupting daughters' love, it's brothers getting in the way of it. Some kind of man, okay? So, he says, but either it was different in blood, Hermia, O oh cross, too high to be enthralled, too low, or else misgrafted, O oh spite. Hermia, O oh hell, to choose love by another's eyes. To choose love by another's eyes. What's that mean? Arrange marriage? That's what she's talking about. Bear in mind Shakespeare. He was 18. Anne Hathaway was 26. Okay. 26. In Shakespeare's day, it's like 45 or 50 today. She was a quote-unquote old spinster. She, she wasn't going to have many more opportunities. Okay. Why did they get married? But what happens three months after? Oh, looky there. Daughter Susanna's born. An amazing, miraculous three-month pregnancy. No, Hell to choose love by another's eyes. Lysander says, 
Or if there were a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream. How are shadows and dreams similar? Are either of them quote unquote real? They're not tangible. They're not real in the sense that you can't feel them. They're not physical. I mean, a shadow, yes, a shadow does exist. Can you touch your shadow? No, that can only exist in the absence of light. Exactly. Okay. And dreams only exist where? Up here. Brief as the lightning and the collied night that in a spleen unfold both heaven and earth, etc., etc. So Hermia. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. An edict. Kind of like a decision. It's a, it's a declarative statement. Destiny says they must be crossed. Then let us teach our trial patience. If we are destined to be crossed, to be star-crossed lovers, she says... Let us teach this trial, this crossing of our desires, <clears throat> patience. Let us patiently endure it. Why? Because it is a customary cross. <clears throat> what does she mean by customary? Yeah, they're not the first ones to experience this. There have been other lovers who have had the same kind of problem. Romeo and Juliet, as an example, you know. As due to love, as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor Nancy's followers. When he says a good persuasion, he means it's a good argument. It's persuasive rhetoric. You're right. Therefore, what's the therefore imply? Conclusion to the argument if we leave the place where destiny, to some extent, law, order has sway, what? We can change our stars. So he says, I have a widow aunt, a dowager, of great revenue. She's loaded. And she has no children. She's outside Athens by seven leagues, and she thinks of me as her only son. I get it all. And she goes, there may I marry you. Why? Seven leagues outside Athens. Athens' law only goes how far? Not seven leagues, apparently. Okay. Shakespeare's plays, not at this point, because this isn't when the globe is constructed yet. Um, but Shakespeare's plays, once they tore down the theater, reconstructed it on the south bank of the Thames, they were outside London law. So that when the Lord Mayor of London closed the theaters in London, all those theaters on Bankside or in Southwark weren't affected. Why? His law didn't extend that far. His law extended to the north side of the bank of the Thames River. So he says, we can go there and we can get married. And she says, great idea. Okay. Helena comes in. So they talk with Helena. I'm going to skip a bunch. And Hermia tells Helena what their plans are. Why? Why do this? Yeah, I mean, Helen is in love with Demetrius. She thinks if she kills Demetrius' plan, then Demetrius will marry her not. Helena thinks that. What I'm, well, my question is, why does Hermia tell Helena what they're planning on doing? Because what Hermia and Lysander are doing is against the law. It, it won't be against the law once they're outside Athens and do it. But she is doing what? She is trying to thwart her father's will. 
and the Duke's will. So it's like, you know, until they get to the boundary of Athenian law, as they're moving away from Athens to the wood, that's all illegal. Once they step outside the boundary, they can you know, wave to the Duke and wave to her father. And he can't touch them at that point. So why does she tell Hermia? Simple reason. Complication. Shakespeare's just introducing another complication into the plot. See, Shakespeare doesn't follow what were called the three unities that Aristotle talked about in his book on poetics. The three unities, P-I-E-S, the unities of action or plot, um, action or plot, setting, and time. Aristotle said there should be one plot. That's it. Okay? There should be one setting. It should all occur at one spot. And it should all occur within 24 hours. How did Aristotle come up with this? He read Greek tragedies, particularly Sophocles' the Oedipus cycle, and said, look, guess what? In each of those, you've got one plot, you've got one setting, for the most part, Oedipus the king all occurs in front of Oedipus's palace. It all occurs within a 24-hour time period. Okay? And there's, it's just that one plot, you know, solve the riddle, essentially. The riddle of who killed the king and such. Okay? Shakespeare's kind of like takes that, blows it up. Because he likes multiple plots. Big overarching main plot and lots of little plots. And he obviously doesn't keep it all within 24 hours, right? I mean, if you look at the Henry IV, Henry the, those aren't within a 24-hour day by any means, okay? So, this is part of his complication. This is part of his, you know, rattling out little plots out of more major plots. So, Hermia and Lysander leave, and we have Helena left on the stage. And she tells us what she's going to do with this information. Line 226, how happy some, uh, some or other some can be, through Athens I am thought as fair as she. That is, throughout Athens, people think I'm as fair as Hermia is. But what of that? So what? What? It doesn't matter what other people think. Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. He won't pay any attention to what anybody else says. Demetrius focused on one thing, what he thinks. And as he errs, okay, Helena says Demetrius is wrong in his thinking. <clears throat> Why? She loves him, and she loves him because he got her to love him. Doting on Hermia's eyes, so I admiring of his qualities. Things base and vile, holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. Things base and vile, holding no quantity. Your gloss tells you that means unsubstantial, unshapely. So what kinds of things? His qualities, right? His qualities are unsubstantial. You can't touch them. She says what? Love can transpose to form, can turn them, can give them form and dignity. So what are his qualities? She says things base and vile. His characteristics, they could use some improvement. What will do the improving? Love. Love. How so? His love for her? Will change him into a better man? Yeah, maybe. I don't think that's what she means. It's her love for him. Everyone here has heard the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. She looks at Demetrius and she sees what? Oh, there's a man. Even knowing what? He cheated on her. 
not physically. He wooed her and then threw her in the dirt. Why? Ooh, Hermia. That's it. Okay? But love can transpose things base and vile to form and dignity. Love's look, love looks not with the eyes. Love isn't about physical form, but with the mind. And we can go right from here straight to Sonnet 116. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. It's a marriage of true minds. Okay? Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged, cupid, painted, blind. Bear in mind, in, in stories about Cupid and stuff, how do people fall in love? It's because Cupid, you know, looking at the hunting. Bang, bang. Mm -hmm. Hunting and seeing? No. Cupid's like Stevie Wonder with a, you know, <laughs> pistol. <laughs> and where it falls, that's who falls in love. That's why love is blind. You never know. Though in medieval literature, if you sit there and rant and rave against love, you, you can count your bottom dollar. You're going to fall in love. And you're going to fall in love exactly with the person you <coughs> least want to fall in love with. Look at the myth of Troilus and Cressida, or Troilus and Cressida. They both kind of hate the other. Why? They're on opposite sides of the Trojan War. And Cupid gets them both. Okay? So, she talks about how love works, <clears throat> nor hath love's mind, like 236, of any judgment taste, wings and no eyes, figure and heating haste, therefore is love said to be a child, blah, 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 blah. So, I'm going to tell Demetrius, he will come after Hermia, I will come after him. Okay. And we get one, two. And we get introduced to what are called variously the clowns, or the rustics, or the rude mechanicals. Rude simply meaning unlearned mechanicals, men who work with their hands. They're mechanics of sorts, okay? And we have Quince the Carpenter. Turn back to the Dramatis Personae for a, for a moment. Peter Quince the Carpenter. Nick Bottom, Weaver. Francis Flute, Bellows Mender. Tom Snout, a tinker. Snug, notice, no first name, just Snug, a joiner, that is a woodworker, and Robin Starveling, a tailor, okay? So, Quince comes in. He asks, is everybody here? And what are they doing? What are they preparing for? A play, because Theseus told Philostrate, go off, rouse up the Athenian youth so that they will put on some revels for our production, okay? So... These guys are going to put on a play. Now, what characterizes them? Think of that word rude that I used. They're unlearned. They've never done any plays before. They don't know how to put on a play. They don't know how to act. Okay? So, they're going to put on the play, line 11, the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Pyramus and Thisbe, it's an old Greek myth. Lovers separated by a wall, by their families. Okay, so you can immediately see the relevance of this play to the larger play, um, who both die for death, die for love. Okay? But it's a lamentable comedy. Comedies aren't supposed to be lamentable. Comedies are supposed to be hilarious, funny. Okay? So he starts reading out the parts and giving out the parts. He tells Bottom, you are set down for Pyramus. Bottom, what is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the right, he goes, but I'd like rather be a tyrant. Okay. So, Quince keeps handing out parts. And what does Bottom keep doing? Let me! So I'll play Pyramus. Ooh, I can play Thisbe too. Uh, let me play the lion. So they finally shut him up. 
parts get handed out, we get Act 2. So we've been introduced to the higher order of civilization, right? The Duke and the Lords and Ladies, so to speak. Then we're introduced to the lower order of civilization, the rude mechanicals. And then we get introduced to characters that aren't part of civilization, so to speak, at all. The fairies. So, all of Act 1 is set in Athens. Act 2 opens in the wood. Puck comes out, another fairy. Puck asks the fairy what, you know, you're doing there. Fairy says, you know, the queen's coming. Puck says, you better not. Line 18 and following. The king is keeping his rebels here tonight. Oberon is passing fell in wrath. Why? Because she adds her attendant hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. So we get a little bit of backstory, a little bit of complication. We find out Oberon and Titania are not getting along. Why? She has done what? She's taken a changeling boy. We've talked about changelings before. She's taken a changeling boy, a boy that was born to a votress of hers, someone who kind of worshipped her. The mother died, and Titania takes the child to be part of her fairy train. This is a human child. Theseus, for some reason, says, no, I want him to be one of my henchmen. And she says, no. Rupture in society, right? So we see human society ripped apart, or beginning to be. We enter here, or excuse me, here, and we see the fairy society ripped apart. Okay? And Puck and the fairy go back and forth. He says, are you that Puck? He says, yes, I am. Puck, by the way, not a Shakespearean in, in, uh, invention. Puck is an Indo-European character. The idea of the Puckish sprite is found in Indian literature, Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata and stuff. It's found in Russian literature. It's found in Greek literature. It's found in Irish stuff. It's kind of Loki, the trickster god, so to speak. Okay. So we see Oberon and Titania come in. Now, I think in every production I've seen, just about, the two or three productions I've seen at the Globe, they definitely do it this way. The same characters who play Theseus and Hippolyta play Oberon and Titania. Okay? In fact, the best production I've ever seen of this, just fantastic. And they didn't record it. They didn't um, videotape it. It was at the Globe, and the characters wore what looked like pajamas, like striped pajamas. I mean, they... That could be interpreted as prison clothing because there's they're blue and white stripes. In the way that you knew they weren't the human characters but were the elves or, or fairies, is they had a little thing in their palm. Press a button and they had like Christmas lights sewn on the inside so they would light up. Oh, and as the sun dropped down, you know, had a super effect in the um, on the stage. So Oberon comes in. Ill met by moonlight. There's that moon again. Proud to Tanya. What? Jealous Oberon. So we're told right there she, that she is saying he is jealous. Fairy skip hence. I have forsworn his bed and company. Notice what she puts first. We're not sleeping together. In fact, I don't even want to be in the same room with her. That's a pretty serious rupture in society, right? I mean, that's, that's the kind of things that leads to literal divorce, you know, a ripping apart. Terry, rash, wanton, am not I thy lord? Terry means, whoa, 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 hold on there. But rash, wanton, your gloss, line 63, headstrong creature. Yeah, that's one interpretation. Another interpretation of wanton can be slut. Terry, rash, slut, rash, impetuous, acting quickly, okay? Husbands, generally not a good idea to call their wives sluts. Then 
I must be thy lady. He says, am not I thy lord? She says, well, if I, you are, then I must be your lady. But I know when that... This is why I think he might mean slut. Because she immediately says what? Well, again, she, if you're my lord, then I'm your lady. And yet I know when you slip away and do what? In the shape of corn, sat all day, playing on pipes of corn and versing love to amorous Philida. Corn and Philida are two types in English literature of the country bumpkin shepherd and the farmer's daughter Philida. I know when you take on a human form and you pretend to be corn to the gorgeous farmer's daughter, why art thou here? Come from the farthest step of India, blah, blah, blah. He turns it back on her. How can, how dare you bring up me in Philida? When, knowing I know thy love to Theseus. So she asked him, why aren't you on the steps of India? And he says, I know your love to Theseus. Well, where are they in approximation to Theseus? They're pretty close. India is thousands of miles away. Notice, he zeroes in a lot more closer. Uh, your lover is like next door. Don't be talking to me about Philida over in you know, India, as it were. Didst not thou lead him through the glimmering night from, and he goes on and mentions, you know, mythical details about Theseus. Theseus is a great Greek hero. You know, Labyrinth, the Minotaur, and all that kind of stuff. These are the forgeries of jealousy. You're just making all this up. She doesn't mean he's literally making it up. She says, you are using these as an excuse for jealousy. So, she talks about, we haven't met since summer. Never since the middle summer spring met we on Hill and Dale, Forester Mead, Bay Mountain, and what happens as a result of that? What happens as a result, she implies, of our not meeting? And I don't think she means just our coming together in company. I think she means sex in bed. Well, everything that begins, 86 and following. Because there is this break in their union, what? What's happening in the natural world? It's not behaving as it ought to do. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain, as in revenge, have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs. So there's a description there. There's now fog running over the land. That is not normal. Okay? They have overborne their continents. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain. The plowman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted. So crops are dying. Human mortals... Line 101, the human mortals want their winter here. That is, they lack their winter here. Um, lost my place. No night is now with him or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air, that rheumatic diseases, blah, 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 blah. Because we are at war, at odds, the natural world is at war. It's not acting normally. Oberon says, you're right, it's not. Do you amend it then? You can fix all that. Now, Shakespeare's playing on this idea, or doc, what sometimes is called the doctrine of correspondences. That is, the macrocosm, the microcosm. What happens in the larger world affects and is mimicked in the lower world, or what happens... In the supernatural happens in the natural, and the elves are, for all intents and purposes, supernatural beings. They're above nature. We are nature. They're slightly above nature. Okay? So he says, you can fix all this. You can fix this breakdown. It lies in you. Why should Titania cross... There's that word again. We've heard it with star-crossed lovers. We've heard it with Hermia saying, we should bear patiently, you know, the cross. 
Why should Titania cross her over? Why are you, think of the image, cutting <clears throat> me off. Why are you going against me? Oh, I want some little changeling. I just want him to be my henchman. It's, it's small. It's nothing. The fairyland buys not the child of me. I wouldn't change your whole kingdom. That's what you mean by the fairyland. If you offered me all of the realm of fairyland, nope, wouldn't take it. Why? She was a votress of my order, blah, blah, blah. How long are you going to stay in the wood? Perchance till after Theseus' wedding day. So when he brought up Theseus, what? He was right. He knows why she's there. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. There's, you're welcome to stay. You could almost say she's offering him a, a little bit of an olive branch here. You know, a little, little makes a piece. Give me the boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. And she just throws down the gauntlet there. So she leaves, and we're left with Oberon and Puck. Go thy way, thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. Ooh, you're going to pay. Okay. So he tells Puck what to do. Talks to him about love and idleness, the flower. What it does, it says, go fetch it. Puck says, I'll put a girdle around the earth in 40 minutes. That's pretty fast. Average satellite takes 90 minutes to circumnavigate in orbit. Okay. So Oberon says, having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing when she waking looks upon, be it on light and bear a wolf or bull, on meddling donkey or a busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. Before I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. Ooh, but who comes here? And he kind of goes, I am invisible. <laughs> and the audience immediately thinks he is invisible. And in come Demetrius, Helena, etc. Notice, Demetrius and Helena, not Hermia and Lysander. Okay, Helena was supposed to follow, kind of. Hermia and Lysander. But she doesn't. She tells Demetrius, and he, she follows him. So, we get introduced to the discord here, and what immediately follows? The discord of the human realm. The huge discord between Demetrius and Hermia. Because if there weren't that discord, uh, Demetrius and Helena, if there weren't that discord, there wouldn't be the discord here. If Demetrius hadn't lied to Helena, there wouldn't be a problem. Because then Aegeus wouldn't have a leg to stand on. He couldn't say, I want Demetrius to marry my daughter, because Demetrius would say, but I love Helena, I don't want to marry your daughter. Let Lysander marry her. So they talk a little bit. And I want to pick up with 214, line 214. And let me back up. Some of this is just too funny to skip. Line 199, Demetrius. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? That is, do I speak fairly to you? Or rather, do I not in plain as truth tell you I do not know I cannot love you? Am I making myself clear? And even for that, do I love you the more? I am your spaniel. And Demetrius, the more you beat, ye, beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me, but as your spaniel, spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me, only give me leave, and worthy as I am to follow you. Okay, so I'm your slave, she's essentially saying. I'm your pet. Demetrius, tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee, and I am sick when I look not on thee. Playing on the idea of love sickness. Demetrius, you do impeach your modesty too much to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not. Okay. 
To trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. He's kind of like going, you're being very careless here because look where we are. We're out in the middle of the woods. And you're a virgin and you're beautiful and I'm a man and I can do what I want. How does she turn that on him? Your virtue is my privilege. I trust you wholeheartedly. For that it is not night when I do see your face. Wherever he is, is what? The sun shines. You are my sunshine. There was a song that had both lines. It is not night when I do see your face, therefore I think I am not in the night. Nor doth this wood lack worlds of company, for you and my respect are all of the world. There's the microcosm, macrocosm. Where we are, we are the whole world. John Donne does that through a lot of his poems. And this idea that where the speaker and the lover are, we are everyone. That is, I am all men, you are all women. I don't need to have another woman because once you and I are together, there's nothing else. So she says, then how can it be said I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run <laughs> from thee. And so he does. All right. Demetrius leaves, Helena leaves, and Oberon. Notice what role Oberon says he's going to play. Fare thee well, nymph. Why does he call her a nymph? What is a nymph? A nymph is a goddess. Low level, low ranking goddess, but a goddess nevertheless. He's saying, you are godlike compared to him. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him and he shall seek thy love. Is he saying, I'm going to make you despise him and make him love you so that he gets a taste of his own medicine? Could be. Puck comes back in. Okay. Oberon tells him what to do with it. Go find Titania. Put it on her eyes. But only put it on her eyes what? When something is going on. But he says also, there's a sweet Athenian lady. And there's an Athenian youth. You'll know him by his clothing. Okay. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. <coughs> Pretty safe to assume there's nobody else in the wood in Athenian garments. 2-2. Two, two. Titania comes in with all her fairies and such. She falls asleep, and Oberon squeezes the juice in her eyes and tells her what to see when she wakes up. Lysander and Hermia come in. And they're tired because they've been wandering for a long time. And he says, well, rest us, Hermia, 30, like 40 or so, if you think it good. Terry, for the comfort of the day, she says, well, be it so, Lysander. Find you out of bed. I, upon this bank, will rest my head. That is, I'm going to sleep here. You go find someplace else. One turf shall serve as pillow for us both. One heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one turf. We'll put our heads upon the same bank. Why? Because we are of one heart. What have they run off to the wood for? To get married, the two shall become one. One bed, two bosoms, one troth, one plighting, one engagement. Nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, for my sake, for my honor, go farther away, do not lie so near, he said, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean anything by one bed. Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I, I mean that my heart unto yours is knit. Knit. It's sewn together. So that but one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms interchained with an oath. Two hearts bound together with a chain. So then two bosoms and a single troth. That's the oath. Then by your side no bedroom me deny. For lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. 
for lying prostrate on the ground next to you, I do not lie. I'm not verbally telling you an untruth. Lysander Rittles, very prickly. I know what you mean. Go over there. Okay, she's, notice, she's defending her modesty. The very thing that Demetrius was telling Helena she wasn't defending enough. Now much beshrew my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say, like, I didn't mean to imply you lied, I'm sorry, but gentle friend, for love and courtesy lie further off in human modesty. Human modesty, what you really appealing to. Human manners, human morality, but where are they? They're in the wood. What happens to manners and morality, which are all part of civilization? Poof. Such separation as, we, as may well be said becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant. Good night, sweet friend. Thy love near alter till thy sweet life end. <clears throat> Don't change your love until what? Till death do us part. Or as Shakespeare put it in Sonnet 116, until doom. Amen, amen to that fair prayer, say I, and then in life when I end loyalty. Oh, here's my bed. Sleep give thee all his rest. Notice, sleep give thee all his rest. Sleep. God of sleep, may Orpheus give to you all your rest that you need. He doesn't say anything about himself. I think that's because Lysander's kind of saying, and you're so close to me, I'm not going to get a night's wink here. Okay? Puck comes in. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found that there's an Athenian maid and there's an Athenian you. Must be him. He puts it on Lysander's eyes. Helena comes in. Demetrius leaves. Helena keeps speaking, and Lysander wakes up. And run through fire, line 109. I will, for thy sweet sake, transparent Helena. Nature shows art. Transparent. Your gloss says radiant, pure. Nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name. I'll kill Demetrius. Do not say so. And she, you know, starts to talk with Lysander. And she goes, you've still got Hermia. Be content. Be happy with Hermia. Content with Hermia? No! Almost like he does the sign of the cross. No, you know. I do repent the tedious... What does tedious mean? Literally, time. Slow passing time. The tedious minutes I spent with her. I with her have spent not Hermia, but Helena I love. Who will not change a raven for a dove? Now, a lot of people don't read that the way I do. But I, I think he's suggesting something about Hermia. If nothing else, hair color. Hermia is dark-haired. Helena is light-haired. Okay? It could also be Hermia is dark-skinned, not necessarily black, but could be tanned. Because in Shakespeare's day, you know what the conception of beauty was? That. I don't mean white like white. I mean that. Queen Elizabeth would powder her face to be white, white. That was the ideal. Notice, who can meet that? Nobody, really. Not even Queen Elizabeth. You smudge and the white's gone. Okay, So, who will not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed. The will, the volition, the desire is swayed by reason. And reason says, you are the worthier maid. How many people do you know of have fallen in love slash gotten married because of reason? That is, they've taken out the yellow legal pad, pros and cons. I'm going to marry because. 
Yeah, that's not how it works. And one thing this poem, this play, is largely about is varying, varying um, notions of love and varying methods of falling in love. Okay? <clears throat> Things growing are not ripe until their season. So I, being young, till now ripe not to reason. What's he saying? Things growing are not ripe until their season. When I loved Helena, uh, when I loved Hermia, what? I was just a boy. She, I didn't know no bear. But now, he says, I am. So I being young, that is then, till now ripe not to reason. And touching now the point of human skill, Reason becomes the marshal to my will. Will there meaning desire. But will also in Shakespeare's day meant sexual desire, sexual organs, and intercourse. So he's got this one sonnet that puns on the word will. Like sonnet 137 or something like that. He uses the word will in it. 20 or 30 times. In 14 lines. I mean, it's just, will, 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 will. And you're sitting there going, okay, so which meaning is it here? Well, you have to bear in mind, every time Shakespeare uses the word will, you've got to ask yourself, okay, is there any context in which it could mean any of these? As well as volition, desire. Hmm. Reason becomes the marshal to my will. Yeah, that could have to do with those. As well as volition. And leads me to your eyes, where I overlook love's stories written in love's richest book. Her eyes are like books of romance, books of love. I look at you, I look in your eyes, and all I see is love. Now you got to admit, that's pretty good. Okay? And she's like, what? Why mock me? He's like, I'm not mocking you. Okay. Helena leaves. Lysander, she sees not Hermia. He knows Hermia's right there asleep. So while he's talking, he's kind of like, oh, your eyes hurt. Well, I don't know. Hermia wakes up, and she thought a dream. She had a dream. Me thought a serpent ate my heart away. And you sat smiling at his cruel prey. To Tanya, meanwhile, because she's still on stage and all this, and we get Act Three. So, two, three, all occurs in the wood. So we've seen part of the upper civilization come into the wood. Now we're going to see the lower class, and we see the rude mechanicals. Why do they go to the wood? <clears throat> Why don't they do their practices, their rehearsals back in Athens? They don't, want them seeing. they don't want anyone seeing them. Bear in mind, in Shakespeare's day, and, and we know this happened. It, it probably happened often, or often enough that actors and acting companies started to have to guard against it. Um, when they would rehearse, there was always the danger of an actor from a rival acting company coming and observing and memorizing the play that they observed and then going back and writing it all out. There were no plagiarism laws. There were no copyright laws. Okay? So that there are copies of plays that are called memorial reconstructions. And some of them are some of Shakespeare's plays that were, we know are not based on actual written copies of Shakespeare's plays because they're so badly memorially reconstructed. But we've got a pretty good idea that this was a regular enough occurrence that they actually, you know, had to come to the point where, you know, you would put a guard outside the globe to keep people from coming in and doing this. So this could be why the rude mechanicals do this. So they start going through their play 
And you can already tell this thing is just going to be awful. Just horrible. Okay? Puck goes off the stage. And while he's off the stage, uh, Bottom goes off the stage. While he goes off the stage, what does Puck do to him? He transforms him. Now, the way it's described in the stage directions here is he puts an ass's head on him. Now, some of the productions I've seen of this play, when Bottom comes back out, he has ass's hooves on his hands and on his feet. That is, he's turned into an ass. The problem is that doesn't work as well with what we see in the play. Because he's supposed to be human and animal. Okay? So he hits the ass of a head. Why? Because Bottom is pretty much a jackass. He acts like an ass does often. Okay? So Bottom comes back in with the ass's head, and everybody runs off. They're, what would you do? Your best friend comes in, and it's not, you know, a paper mache head. It's a literal, his head is now a donkey's head. You would run screaming too, okay? Bottom doesn't understand this. He doesn't realize he has the ass's head. And so, to calm himself, he starts to sing. <clears throat> but Bottom doesn't sing beautifully. Oh, so God, so black and <coughs> blue of you with Orange Tony Bill. That's how he should sing. So that when Titania awakes and she says, what angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The very fact that she thinks this is an angel singing <coughs> tells us she's not in the right mind. The, the, the potion didn't only affect her eyes. <laughs> it, it affected everything upstairs. I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape and thy fair virtue. He doesn't have any fair virtue. Perforce doth move me on their first view to say, to swear, I love thee. How should Titania look? Not even here, just when she's first introduced. Drop, dead, gorgeous, knockout, most beautiful woman in the world, etc. Bottom? Not. Just everything else. Even before he gets the ass's head. Bottom should not be necessarily an attractive guy. Doesn't mean he has to be foul and ugly, but just, you know, not somebody you'd look at and go, you know, if you're male, it's not fair. Or if you're a woman, mm. it should be kind of, mm. and now he's different. Okay, we'll pick up with somewhere in 3132 on... Whatever day that is. Thursday. Tuesday. Today's Thursday. Man. Our whole semester is going to be.